webinar style meetings in place of our World Championship, which we have had to postpone for one year, but hopefully most of us in this meeting and many others will meet up uh, in a year's time at Skerries and we'll actually manage to do some sailing against each other. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to, to Ian, to Mike and to Shane. I just thank them all for taking part in this. It's very much appreciated to Anne Penny for lining it up and I'm going to sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll make the start. Um, I think the format of this is going to be sort of fairly relaxed. We, we, we're fairly uh, open and uh, as you see, we're all certainly excited with the beer. So perfectly happy to take questions probably throughout. Um, and to be honest, there's not that many people on, so do feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask a question. That's absolutely fine. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to... I think obviously we've got myself here, we've got, got Mike uh, and we've got Shane. Uh, and I think what would be quite interesting from my, my point of view as well, I hope, would be to start by maybe reflecting on, um, on maybe how you put a campaign together for the World Championships. Uh, certainly, obviously, with probably with the intent of, of trying to win it. So each of our perspectives on, on that. Um, and then there was a bit of a request to, to talk about some mods some ta tactics, which we'll come on to. Um, and then progress on to something else, which Mike can introduce later, hopefully. But uh, maybe um, we'll take a, take a start on uh, on sort of campaigning. Um, how to how do you campaign for you know a major championships like the World Championships? How do you go about it when you're when you're you know looking to win or looking to achieve certainly to a high level? Um, now. Uh, so I'm very happy for, for Mike and Shane to chip in here, but I think maybe I'll sort of start with my sort of first uh, ambition for that, which was um, back in the Sligo World Championships, and I can't even remember what year that was. Anyone want to uh, remind me what, what year Sligo was? 2006. 2006, there we go. So I suppose the, the backdrop of me was, uh, I think the previous World Championships was a 2003 one, wasn't it, in, uh, in Abbasop? which was a major world championship with, you know, 150 votes um, plus or whatever it was, 180, uh, you know, and some of some legends that, that I was sort of, uh, I saw competing the likes of uh, Neil Mars and Richard Esto and, and Jim Hunt et al. Uh, and, and, you know, I think I was back in the, in the bronze suite in that, in that time, obviously relatively young, it wasn't a problem, but, you know, the years progressed and, and, um, and we did a lot of GPSM with Andy Tunnicliffe, uh, who I've served with, as you, you may know, since I was a very young lad. Um, and uh, and we targeted specifically the Sligo World Championships. We were quite for fortunate, I suppose, that, um, that Andy was uh, at working at Goja Sales. Um, and the benefit of that was that ticked off probably one of the major boxes on your sort of preparation list, which is kit, you know, having the right kit in place, having the right boat, having the right sales, having the right equipment as, as a general package. Um, so that, that, that hand was sort of dealt to, it, dealt to us uh, because we used what was the works boat uh, with Andy working at Gocha Sales. Um, so that puts it in good stead. Uh, but I suppose we were relatively inexperienced back in, back in those times. Um, although we'd done a lot of youth sailing, you know, a lot of youth sailing, a lot of 420 sailing. And so we, you know, we were pretty sharp, but we were certainly inexperienced at the front of the GP fleet perhaps. Um, and so we, we opted to get a few things right, which, you know, we were always going to be relatively small in comparison to some of the other guys. And, and the, we recognised quite early on who were those people going to be. Uh, and it was the likes of uh, Jim, um, of, um, you know, I think, you know, Jim and Carl, Carl Jeffs. Um, but we spent a lot, a lot of time on, on, uh, on fitness, on fitness and, uh, and weight. Even though we're still probably in the sort of 85 and 72, sort of maybe 80, 82 kilos and 72 kilos between helm and crew, we actually spent a lot of time trying to lose weight during that uh, sort of build up to that campaign. Um, because we thought that if we were fitter than the other people, we could, we could compete in the really windy stuff, but absolutely decimate them in the lighter stuff. So that was our sort of strategy for the, for the World Championships. And, and uh, at the time I, I finished university, or I was at university, um, 
on a on a summer break and i i decided to work up, up uh, for the first time i've ever worked during the summer holidays actually it was i worked worked at go to sales for a, a few weeks or a few months uh, and that was obviously in order to to get some time on the water with andy uh, and to be honest we sailed you know for those sort of two months building up to the world championships we were sailing you know three four times times a week at least together you know doing a couple of hours uh, on the water um, at windermere and that made such a major benefit to to our boat handling uh, and that's obviously another sort of tick list on your on your on your preparation is boat handling you know you've got to make sure you're slicker than the other guy uh, so when that opportunity arises you can punish him you can punish them around the corners and you can really put them under pressure so being in the right place with Andy was fortunate, and that, that's that, that's that's why we're there. One thing that I will uh, will touch on there is that we also saying uh, did some training at Row Island, which is uh, Barrow. Uh, if anyone knows it, uh, and in the river estuary to Barrow, the, the tide certainly rips in. If you've ever wanted to um, ever wanted to find a way of training for a gate start on your own, um, it's fine six knots of tide and a big channel marker. Uh, and then you can practice a, a, a gate boat coming across uh, or, or a ginormous channel marker coming across at six knots. It was a really quite a funny way of doing uh, practicing for gate starts, I thought. Um, so I think that, that ticked off three of the key things for me was time on the water, getting our boat handling sorted, getting the right kit in place and being fitter on the other, than the other guy. In terms of experience and tactics and being smarter than the other guy, actually, it's not something you can really easily tick off in, in three months or six months of building up. That's something that accumulates over time. Um, but it turned out when we got there, you know, it was a windy week. Uh, and actually, we'd lose, you know, uh, three boat lengths upwind uh, to Carl Jeffs but we, uh, in, the, in the windy stuff. But we'd take 300 metres from him downwind. Um, and that's... That that's kept us in the game all the all the time, all the week until it got light, and then when it got light, you know we were winning races quite comfortably, and that put us really in a strong position to win. So that was the first world championship we won, uh, and that's the that was the one. Obviously, went through the biggest learning curve. Um, once you've made that that step up, once you've made those gains, they do stick with you for quite a while. Uh, they do get eroded away, but they they stick with you once you've made those those gains, those leaps. Uh, then you can sort of uh, uh, live off that for a little while. So that was my experience of, uh, of Sligo. So um, maybe Michael Shane can have a, have a reflection on that or comment on it, in fact, perhaps. Well, um, I think I was having a hiatus from GPs at that point for a few years. <laughs> so, Must have been. You know, my, uh, uh, back then, I was... I was supposed to do 2003 Worlds, do a proper campaign for it because we won the Nationals in 2002 in Abbasock and I was sort of sailing a 49er at the time, um, not thinking about university and failing exams, which I then had to resit, which meant Jim Hunt had to, had to take my spot in, uh, in Abbasock. So, uh, and then, then I decided to focus on the 49er and my career for a few years. So I had a hiatus until pretty much when you were dominating him. Is when I wasn't there, which is probably why. Um. Ah, yeah, I, I don't doubt that for a little, for a slightest little bit, yeah. I <laughs> know, oh, but you know, you, you gave me my uh, my fair share of ass kicking when I came back to GPs. So um, yeah, it's uh, I had a lot of catching up to do when I came back to it. Um, if I uh, shall, I touch a little bit on. I'll touch a little bit on um, Mount Bay. God, it seems ages ago now, two years ago. <laughs> And, and how we approached that, because um, even though we won, we didn't actually get it, uh, that it didn't actually go to plan. If anyone saw our first day, it was an absolute disaster. So um, still still amazed that we uh, still managed to pull it, out, pull it out of the bag, to be honest with you. Um, but it did, I have managed to reflect on it uh, a fair bit. So um, what I, I, I gave this a little bit of thought earlier and I, um, I thought about how to prepare for a championship and I split it into three, three areas in the long term, which will be one year plus out from the event you're targeting, the medium term, which is basically the, the prep you're doing in the season up to the event. So if you were doing the Worlds in Scaries this year, it would have been from, say, March up until now. And then the short term, which is, which is the week before. So um, 
so I think if, if I run through those, I think you, hopefully everyone will be able to take something from it. So, so long term, a year out, and the reason why I say it's a year out as being one year plus is you can't really fix, it's very difficult to fix these things in within a year of an event. So the first thing is um, you've got to sort out, I will, you've got to sort out your boat speed, first of all. So it means having the right ship, Having, making sure your, your boat is, is sorted. If you're doing that sort of stuff a month or so before the event, in my opinion, it's just too late. So you've got to be happy with your equipment and happy that you're on, on the pace about a year before, before you, you even started to think about, about winning. Um, and and in, in, um, in relation to that, you've also got to have the best possible crew weight combination. So if you look at the people who won the Worlds, um, over the past few years, um, we're all pretty much about the same crew weight. So around about, on all the way to about 23 stone up to about 25, I think. I think Neil Marsden in 2003 with Derek was probably about 22. It's an outlier. Um, and you've, and so it's, that's compared to other classes, that's actually quite a wide range, to be honest with you. So if you're, if you're stone out in other classes, you'll get absolutely hammered but somewhere between 23, 25, maybe 26 if it's a windy week. Um, so I think Chris and I at um, Mounts Bay were weighing in at probably around about 25 stone all up. So it's probably towards the, the top end of that. Um, and also related to what Ian said, you've got to be um, really fit. So um, again, if you look at anyone who's won the event over the past, well, forever, um, even when Esto was dominating, um, they were really fit in the boat. So and that's something you've got to fix in a, about a year plus from the event, really. Um, so those those are the those are the long term things to, to focus on. Um, but the, when you when you're looking at those things, particularly with with fitness um, and crew weight, I always think it's best to try and fix them really slowly. So the principle of compound interest: try to get quick. Um, incrementally and then eventually those compound gains will, will, will really start to tell. So those are our, our long-term aims um, and our long-term plan. And my long-term plan for Mounts Bay was actually um, by, by sacking Liz and, and bringing Chris into the boat. <laughs> so, that's, punchy, that's punchy in the long, long term, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, she's upstairs sorting <laughs> the kids out at the moment. So I reckon I can say that. So no one dubbed me in. And... <laughs> The, um, but the main reason is because our roll-up weight was 21 stone with Liz and me together. So we were absolute dynamite in light winds. So when the year, be, uh, was it the year before? No, 2016, we almost won Patelli Nationals, but Shane gave me a good hiding on the last day when it was windy. We just couldn't. We did a good job of taking him out, actually. Much better job than I did with Dubbo the year after. And, um, but, he, uh, but he was way too fast for us when it was windy. So we just got... We got found out. So um, the irony uh, that so, um, the irony that the World Championships was really light pretty much all week, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, and she reminds me of that constantly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but planning out for Mountains Bay is if you look at lots of previous championships at Mountains Bay, you're looking at champagne conditions, fifteen to twenty knots most days. It's right on the tip of Cornwall you're generally not going to have a light week there. So my thinking was, you've got to be, uh, got to be a, a decent weight. So um, I teamed up again with Chris, who was, um, he's like a, we always, we joke about Chris White, he's like a 1.5, we always joke he's a 1.5 diesel Peugeot 206, in that um, he does, he's not very, um, what's, the, what's the right phrase to use? Not very exciting. He's not very exciting, but it'll just keep on hiking forever. It'll just keep on going forever. <laughs> so if you want someone to hike out in the boat, he's an absolute dynamite at that. His boat handling is pretty good as well. So um, yeah, so we so we, we teamed up again after we had a go at, at Lou in 2012. Um, so that was the long term stuff. The medium term stuff. So the season before, oh sorry, the season up to the event, uh, we didn't actually get that quite right for Mount Spain, in my opinion. We didn't do, we didn't really do enough sailing. Um, we were in pretty good form because we were, we were fast at loop the year before. Um, 
It's all right, it's Lizzie's phone. Let's turn that on. Um, so, sorry, I just lost my trail of thought then. She's got someone calling her called Glug. <laughs> I have no idea who that is. <laughs> Only someone who'd like to drink. Um, so, um, yeah, so but our main things going and up to the event were make sure we did some practice at a C venue. So South Staffs every year go to Newquay in, in Wales, which is a cracking venue. If you ever want a small fishing town village to go sailing at, it's the race course is just off the beach and it's and I've had, it's the only time I've ever actually been scared in the GP there a few years ago when it was really windy. So the waves are enormous. Um, uh, make sure you do some uh, practicing your racing sharpening your skills. So we've always made sure we do something like the Inlands or, or a couple of events. And then we focused on boat handling really just at the club. We can't really, can't really beat South Staffs for having to do lots of tacks and lots of jibes and things like that. So um, the only thing I think we got wrong for Mounts Bay was we didn't do enough racing. So in, because um, it's, the world at the end was in, it's in the middle of August, I think at Mounts Bay. Is that right? It's one nod. Yeah, that was right. And um, so I think the last time we raced before that, I think was towards the end of June. So it's way too big a gap, really, to, to, to get there sharp. Um, and then when we got to Mounts Bay, uh, the, the, practice, the, the practice day or the Saturday was really windy. Um, and I didn't think it was a good idea to go practicing. Um, and I was watching Ian practice with... Um, with Tunny when it was really windy and I thought oh, that's a bit dodgy that is um so I just thought I'd just watch them instead rather than go out and then the next day was cancelled so all in all we turned up to the first race pretty like pretty fit um we confident in the boat speed confident in everything else but not very race sharp and then the conditions on the first day if you remember at Mounts Bay were um it was pretty offshore really shifty um sort of conditions I usually excel in and I absolutely cocked it up big time so um so we were we were lucky to to come out of that day with what we did to be honest with you so um that's the uh, that's the stuff to get right into the event is make sure you get the preparation I actually think that racing you do prior to event is, is quite important because I think you can do too much because if you go to an event and, and do too much racing prior to it, you can, you can end up overthinking it. So it's, it's trying to get that happy medium and that's different for everyone. So for me, I probably need to race probably four or five times before an event in the year. Um, but make sure the, the event before it is probably within four weeks or so. And then that would be enough. Um, then the short term. So I've done long term, medium term and the short term, which is the week before. Now for me, this is possibly the most important thing with a young family is making sure I get logistics and everything right coming into it because that can just destroy everything that happens in an event. So if I, I won't be able to sail well unless I know the family's well catered for and the kids are happy and all that sort of stuff. So I gave a lot of thought into Mount Bay in terms of how we get down there, when we get down there. Do we, I think we drove down in two stints, so we stayed overnight somewhere. Um, made sure I was eating the right things the week up to the event, um, making sure I was looking at the forecast, um, looking, it was looking breezy and then light. So um, just making sure I was just feeling um, quite nimble about the boat and, and things like that. Um, we're also pretty organized at home. So we, we, we were, went with the week with a meal plan. So we, um, I knew what we were eating each night. It's just all this tiny little stuff. It just takes all the hassle out when you're there. Um, and trying to organize some time to test your boat handling, which we didn't get to do because it was windy. Hence why we had a horrendous first day, I think. So um, that was our prep for the world. So hopefully that's been, that's been useful. Um, and um, maybe I'll touch on later how we turned it around. But do you want to add anything, Shane? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I guess uh, some of it will be a bit of overlap. Um, I'm happy to sort of talk around what we do in our boat with the, with the, with the usual disclaimer is that we don't, we don't claim it's right, but you can, you can make your own mind up. Um, but what, what I would say is, is kind of when you're asked to talk about tactics or things like that, um, 
I think when you look at the, the, the top teams, so like um, Dabo and Tony or Mike and Chris or Birdie and Potsy or, or whatever, um, I, I think the thing that they, they probably just have a, a little bit of speed, just a little speed advantage over every other boat. And, you know, if they, as long as they get a good start, then they, they sooner or later pop out in the front and then they can do what they want and they get all the benefits of clear air. So it's kind of more about what, what you do and, and the preparation is a bit about what you do to get to get the speed your speed advantage and just get the little edge over everyone else. Uh, I think there's probably I've done a few notes, but I think there's probably sort of three aspects to that, or I think there's three anyway. There's there's probably well there's the fundamental stuff. So, so that'd be one group. The fundamentals like like your boat is your boat good enough? Is boat down to minimum weight? Is your rig set up right? Um, helm and crew weight is that correct? Um, so that they're sort of that's sort of one group. The second bit, uh, and both Mike and Ian have touched on this, would be the the boat handling and the, and the boat technique. And you, you know your sail technique, how, how you sail the boat, and and you have to be you have to be really sharp at that. Really, I mean, I mean, any of the people who won the world, say their boat handling is is better than the, the majority of the fleet, um, and and that just means that they're getting a little bit of advantage on every tack or whatever. They're not losing it, and it gives them a bit more freedom. And then the last thing that I think, which is probably the most important, is, is your crew. And again, if you look at the top people, the guys are crewing for them. So if you take Tony or Potsy or Chris or Taxi, and they're, all, they're all like super helms in their own right. So that, that's such an advantage in that, you know, if there's two of you in the boat, they're thinking along the same lines. You're, you're less likely, you have two sets of eyes, and you're less likely to make a, you know, a stupid mistake. And then if you do get a bad start or anything, to help, you can just put it down and just concentrate and say them fast, knowing that they're going, they're going to tell you, you know, call pick the lanes or whatever. So it gives you that sort of, like, get out of jail, get guarded a little bit. So, so they're the kind of three aspects that probably contribute to most speed. And I can kind of relate that back then to myself and Taxi for, for the World Student 16. And, plus, and it might put some relevance to it for us. But in terms of the... The fundamentals um, and weight, I think we were about, we were, I, I kind of know in kilos, we were sort of between 150, 155 kilos. Um, we, we were going to be too heavy, I remember that beforehand. And so I had to lose a bit of weight. We were both supposed to lose a bit of weight, but um, I'm not sure how much taxi, taxi lost. And that's kind of why I can't really give an exact figure to our weight because uh, he tends to lie a little bit. He, he tells me what I want to hear. So. So uh, it was somewhere between 150 and 155. Um, in terms of our boat, the boat we had, we had a winder. Um, it was a couple of years old, uh, two years old. So it had been weighed at the previous world. So I knew it was a uh, bang on minimum weight. We, we actually got it weighed. I think in that world's up in Northern Ireland, you had the option of getting it weighed. So we're able to do that and make sure it's minimum weight. And it, it kind of, I think it takes, I don't know, as Mike Green said, it does take a bit of time to sort out the boat. Uh, obviously HD sales, because that was, I was taxi, um, and uh, then the setup. That was another one of the fundamentals. We our setup's pretty simple. It's probably easier than most people tend to sail off one rig setting for eighty or ninety percent of the time. If it's really windy, you put on a bit more tension and a bit more rake. And I suppose to give an idea for anyone who was at Barbados, the um, there was only one one time that we went to rake to the windy setting. It was quite a windy event. But there was only one stage we went to rake back and increase the tension. And that was, that was actually about 10 minutes before they, they abandoned the race and sent us ashore because it was too windy. So, so we don't go to it very often. Um, there's one other thing I wrote down a note. Oh yeah, so I mean, I guess that preparation for that one, that was a, an unusual event because it was so far away. We kind of got quite organized in terms of getting uh, spares so kind of duplicates of everything, duplicate shrouds, duplicate halyards, duplicate foils, and just in case anything went wrong over there. And actually when, when we got there, there was a crack in the fixed rudder. So we ended up using the spare rudder for the event, which is a lifting rudder. Um, but that, that was kind of it. That, that's, that's kind of looks after fundamentals. In terms of the, the, the actual boat handling and boat, boat uh, sail technique, was slightly more difficult for us because I was based in the UK. I was based in Ireland, taxi in the UK. But um, we did a little bit. We did a couple of the 
sales use winter series events the, the world's in March and we had over one weekend to sail against um, Dobbo and Tony and Petrelli um, and we were able to test a couple of things I think we put in a new centre board for that weekend yeah 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 there was, a, there was an issue with all the winter centre boards were vibrating and so I think Taxi Google this and came up with a theory that a thinner one would be better which was um, I kind of had reservations, but we were able to test it again that weekend. And, and it, you know, we didn't seem to stop the vibration. We didn't lose height against things. That kind of gave us the, the confidence to go with it. Um, yeah, it, like it, it, it's not ideal. It wasn't ideal. I was able to do a lot of practice in Ireland with Irish crew. So, um, but on a new taxi, it's obviously so, such, a, such a good sailor, so super. They knew he was going to jump into the boat and be no, no, no problem. But at the same time, it wasn't wasn't ideal either. We were a bit rusty to begin with, so our results got better as the week went on. Um, so ideally, we would spend a lot more time sailing together. Um, it seemed to work okay. So um, I don't know if that's like a good. I don't know if that's a good place to pause and see. Does anyone have any direct questions or um, want anything specific? Because I'm, I'm kind of conscious that we're talking a bit top line as opposed to. Someone, someone so, yeah, it's, it's interesting for me to hear you two guys anyway, because I, I, you know, I, I draw my own parallels with the campaigns that I made, you know, you know, and listen to yours that, that were successful. So it's always interesting, and it's really easy to see your your own mistakes. I think, um, yeah, it's very interesting. But yeah, I think you're right. Opening up to the floor, and there are any questions on campaigning about, you know, how do you how do you target an event? How do you put time in? So I'm just going to move outside. Um, bit of right. inside. Yeah, I think um, I, I'd sort of draw a few things from from um, from what Mike said. It was you know actually you've got to put mm -hmm. the resources. You know the honest truth is to sort your admin out, to sort your family out, to sort your you know your life out. It takes a lot of resource and 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 that's both time and money uh, to you know. To do your setup, not the sailing, not the you know, not the boat, not the kit. You know, when you're campaigning for an event, actually, you've got to have the right kit. Yes, you've got to have the right, almost the right house, almost. You know, not doesn't have to be glamorous, but it needs to work for you. You know, what I mean, whatever works for you. And if that's if sleeping in your van works for you, then that's absolutely fine. But for a lot of people, it might not work. Um, so I think that's that's a fair fair point. Um, and we've we've all you know we, we've sort of all took touched a little bit on, on, on boat stuff, boat set up, boat kit. Um, it's of course a given, you know, that the guys that want to win need the best kit. And, and um, I'll add to that is that a lot of the mistakes that I've made have been trying to change kit, change, changing kit for different stuff uh, that sometimes you need to, but sometimes it's always resulted in some random problem. You know, we talked about foils in Barbados uh, when we, we, we were trading with, tax, uh, with Taxi and Shane and we opted to go down some Malayans, uh, which was fine. It was really good. And whatever happened later on, I think, um, you know, in the event, we ended up snapping our tiller. Uh, you know, fine, that, there was a problem there. Then I had a replacement one, and, and the replacement one was a backwards-shaped uh, shaped, uh, curve on the rudder blade. And uh, that ended up catching a lot of weed on a weed, really weedy day, you know. It's random stuff that you never really bothered about, but just happened because you haven't tested the kit. Yeah, I, I think uh, just to add to that, I think um, the uh, I hear lots of conversations about kit all the time and I'm in a fortunate position that I've managed to own and sail pretty much every type of GP hull there is, um, I think. And um, and there, and I've gone back to the, the one I originally sailed in from uh, almost about 20 years ago now. Jesus, I'm old. And um, <laughs> yeah, and... And, and my settings haven't changed pretty much at all since back in 2000, 2002, or whenever it was, I was, I was sailing the rocket then. Um, yes, things have, have might have incrementally changed, changed a few things, but it, I, I, I totally agree with what Ian said, and, and I'd, I'd avoid doing any radical changes, unless you know you've got a boat which is massively slow for being overweight or whatever reason. It's generally not the reason why why you're probably going slow. It's there's lots of other um, easier things. I mean, the guy, the the tuning guys that Richard Esto wrote in the 90s are still just as relevant today as they were back then. So, 
Um, there's no, I don't think there's any, any, any quick fixes, um, any quick fixes to be, to be had there to go fast. Mike, can I ask you a quick question? Uh, yes. Chris, Chris Hearn. Uh, I think you've sailed, well, Racy's Rocket, obviously, which is wooden. Yeah. And you've sailed some pl fan plastic fantastic boats as well. Yeah. Um, and you seem to go back to Racy's Rocket, even though it's quite a, an old boat, isn't it? I mean... Yeah, it's a home that, build, yeah. Home built as well, yeah. That, yeah. That's amazing to me. But um, you, you obviously find it a fast boat. Do you think that um, wooden boats, you know, they can still compete with the plastic boats just as well? Or is it something unique about Racy's Rocket? Um, no, I think no, there's nothing um, there's, there's no, nothing slow about plywood's a fantastic material. So um, just, I think you just got to look after it, to be honest with you. So it's just a bit more maintenance. So if, if I was going to compare Racy's Rocket to the other boats I've sailed, I think the, I think the Duffin I had was an absolute dynamite downwind, to be honest with you. It was, I was um, I always felt like I, I was, it was a tiny bit, tiny bit slower at wind. Only only marginally, but I got away with it. Uh, whereas I just think Racy's Rocket is just, um, it's probably just a bit better all round. And um, I also love just um, winding people up about it because no one else, could, no one else has got one. So I just say it's lucky it's, it's faster than everyone else's boat and you can't buy it. So tough. <laughs> so. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll add quickly to that, you know, in the, in the four championships that we won, actually it turns out they were all in, um, in Duffins, um, uh, and uh, having depart, having left the Duffins, uh, subsequently lost two world championships in a row. Um, and I, but that's not to say that I, I'm putting it down to that. But it, what it what it just means is that you know when you move to something, some new bit of kit, actually it is hard and it is different. You know what I mean? But that's not to say the new kit's wrong or worse. It's just that um, you know you quite like going back to what you uh, you know what, what you used to a little bit, and that's a bit yeah. of a flaw, perhaps. And, yeah. Um, I, I even like the fact that um, my, my boat has got on, on deck tracks rather than through deck. Um, I just think it, I like the fact that no one else has really got it anymore. And, um, and, and we never, I never adjust it ever. <laughs> it stays in the same hole every single wind condition, pretty much. So, um, Chris might yeah. like it on Mike, does he? Sorry? It's okay, <laughs> it's okay for you to like it, so you don't have to hike over us. Yeah, just, yeah, I just, just I like it so much. Yeah. It's time to stop moaning. I think it, it <laughs> diverts, the, diverts the pain that's going through your quads onto your hammies a little bit. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's a benefit <laughs> worth having. <laughs> um, should we uh, move, move on a little bit? Do feel free to ask more sort of questions on that. Um, we wanted to touch a little bit on tactics. Um, now, that's, that's a really hard. Uh, topic to, to talk about. You know, we, we've actually not, you know, in our preparation stuff, we've actually not talked about, well, we need to get sharper at tactics because it turns out that actually it takes, sailing is a really hard sport and it takes uh, 10 years, 20 years to, to learn a lot of uh, instances. Now, which is maybe something I'll, I'll, I'll try and hit on a little bit. Um, the reason why it takes so long is there's so many permutations, right? There's so many, um, there's so many things that can happen. Right, and, and you know, and we we don't know the answers. No one knows the answers, um, and you have to make your best judgment at the time. Uh, and so it is about judgment calls. Um, but I think what happens over that time, over those years, you build up a, a playbook, a call book, uh, you know, a lot of experience. Uh, and sometimes you can rationalise that in your head. You know, I know uh, that that if if this happens, this is going to happen, or this might, this is most likely to happen. You can rationalize those sort of uh, experiences you've had before. Sometimes you might not know what the answer is, but you recognize, and people call this a feeling, oh, I've got a feeling about this. Well, actually, it's not a feeling. What it actually is, is you're calling upon your experience, and you've and you recognized that a situation might end well, or it might end badly, um, and it's calling on your experience. So you call it a feeling, but that might be just because you can't articulate it to yourself. So perhaps um, what I might try and do is share a few images here um, in a second um, of a series that I did in, in Mainsail. I realized it's actually quite a few years ago now, and it's called Alarm Bells. Uh, and the backdrop to this series of pictures that I did in Mainsail, and it was quite hard to 
to do, obviously, in written format. Perhaps actually people didn't necessarily understand it. Uh, was that try and highlight the thing that I just talked about is that recognizing when you're in a situation that might become problematic. Once you recognize that situation early enough, you can make decisions that will then not lead to the bad outcome or you know that, that might occur. Yeah. So uh, let's give this a go at sharing uh, this. Let me get my page up. Uh, oh, if you can't, but I'm just going to say. Right, so this is a, a series that I said did, um, and it's looking at um, it's looking at how to um, how to predict things, right? Um, so this is the, this is the scenario, okay? So this is uh, this is reaching out of the out of the, uh, out of the wing mark. We've gone around the wing mark, uh, and we're getting rolled, right? That's what, that. This is the problem scenario, uh, and you know it's something that that people get rolled out out of reach mark can sort of uh, definitely uh, have done it before, we've all done it before. But how do we rewind, how do we rewind the scenario and get to the situation where we predict what's gonna happen and then make a different decision so that this outcome doesn't happen? So if we perhaps go back through, um, back through time a little bit. Uh, so we're in the, what color boat are we in? We're in the red boat here. Um, so this is this is the precursor. This is the precursor to, to what happens when we get low. Perhaps it's a situation where, oh look, there's a boat there. I've been forced to get my bow just outside him at the jive mark. And that's put me in a really vulnerable position. And then it leads on to getting rolled. Okay, from here, I'm in trouble. I can't actually make a decision that's gonna, well, I might be able to, it might be putting the handbrakes on. It might be, it might be trying to get out of that lock. But it's it's already too late. I've already have to do some bad decision. You know, I've already got to make some evasive action to get out of this scenario. So we wind back a little bit further and see how the hell did we uh, how the hell did we get to there? Well, perhaps it's this. Perhaps it's we're approaching the wing mark. Maybe it's a long way away, right? And actually, maybe it's that we've we've been trying to roll these two guys here. We've oh look, I'm getting close to this this light blue boat here. I'm going to roll him. I'm going to roll him. But maybe that's not the decision. So maybe, actually, as we progress down the reach, we change from an attacking scenario, perhaps trying to roll this blue boat. We're then looking to sink down that. We're looking to drop down onto this blue guy's line, right? Um, so that the, the scenario doesn't unfold, that we end up outside, outside the giant mark, yeah? So it's about predicting the scenarios three steps ahead and then looking about where I am now and what's going to happen in the in the following scenarios? Anybody? So maybe open up a little bit. Thoughts on on sort of uh, getting rolled on reaches? I suppose this is, this is I say tactics, but it's actually it's boat on boat tactics, and that's uh, definitely a significant element of, of tactics, and certainly even in big fleets, I'd say. So anyway, any thoughts on uh, on on sort of getting rolled on a reach, or even indeed how to how to stop this happening? I suppose. There's, there's probably a lot of other permutations that, that happen to get to uh, getting rolled on a reach. And one is, one is obviously not being very good at, at jiving, you know? I'll add, um, I'll add something on rolling people on reaches. So um, if you go back to the other picture, Ian. So this one here, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you're the, um, so if I'm the, the red boat there, if they want to roll the green boat and the light blue boat they've got all sorts of problems because if the green boat let's say the, let's take the jive mark out of the issue and it's windy and it's planing conditions the green boat and the light blue boat are most likely just going to head up and stop them rolling them in that position and uh, in my boat I, or in, my, in our head we always have what's called like an unwritten two boat length to windward rule so if I want to roll someone I will always set myself up, or I'll try to set myself up two boat lengths to windward of the boat in front. Um, because from two boat lengths to the boat windward, windward to the boat in front, they're not going to be able to come up to me regardless of what happens, and they're getting rolled if I'm faster. So whether it's a tactic or just a little technique, I don't know. But if you are faster than the boat in front, you want to roll them. Don't just come up behind them and aim just to go just over the top of them because they'll just put the tiller down and you're in all sorts of bother there. Make sure you. Give yourself about <clears throat> about two boat lengths gap to windward, and then they've got no chance of, of closing that gap. Then, does that make yeah. sense? 
Yeah. You usually call it the passing lane, don't they, Mike? Sometimes it's sometimes yeah. passing lane. You get into passing lane, and then nobody can really get up to you. So if you're faster, you can. Get to you. And what and what you'll what you'll see at big events is if you see is if you see the likes of myself, Ian, or Shane, or or whoever have a bit of a mare up the first beat, and it's a, and it's a windy day. You'll generally you'll generally find that the windward mark um, will delay our kite hoist because we know the boats around us were were faster. So what we'll do is we'll just we'll just sail on a two sail reach for thirty seconds a minute or so, just further up, just so we've got a clear lane to windward of everyone else. We'll pop our kite and know that we've got a passing lane above the heart above a lot of the fleet and there's so many times that's got me out of trouble and I've taken 15 20 boats or so on the first reach which sounds like a lot but if going back to what Ian said earlier when he was when he was younger in 2006 I think he said he had to fight for two boat lengths at wind but then downwind you could take 300 meters just like that that's, that's exactly the reason why so mm. so if you see so if you see us position two boat lengths to windward of you on the reach you're in trouble <laughs> it's the best thing I would say. That's a good one. So let me just try and share a different. Uh, I'm not sure if I've minimised myself. So I'm fighting now, fighting windows here. Give me two seconds. Um, do carry on for another twenty seconds. See, the thing is, um, uh, what I will actually, I'm just about to move on to actually, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, is, is approaching, similarly about getting rolled on reaches, is approaching the windward mark. Um, so, uh, you know, how, how, what's your experience, Mike, of, of how to prevent getting uh, rolled on uh, coming out of a windward mark? Um, it's, it's just, it's like at most windward marks, you're just prepping 30 seconds a minute to in advance. So just, Similar to what you're talking about here, is having foresight to think what what are the options that's gonna that are gonna play out in this in this scenario. So, um, if you don't want to get rolled on on a wind with mark, you've got to. A lot of it comes down to boat handling, making sure your your kite hoists are are hot or really good. So, um, uh, so if you are gonna catch, set the kite early, and there's a boat right behind you. Um, if you're faffing around for 30 seconds with the kite flapping and all that sort of stuff, it's game over. You've, you've already been rolled. So um, you want to be really confident that that, that kite's going to, that's going to, um, that's going to set. Um, I hate to um, blow my own trumpet, but the, uh, there's a video from us at the Lou Nationals. And I th I'm pretty sure we get the kite set in like less than two seconds, I think. On one of the on one of the mark roundings, I'll I'll dig it out and send it to the association to send round at some point. But um, so practicing kite hoist all the time is is so crucial. I, I can't I can't tell you how many boats we've passed from having good kite hoists. And that's windward and, and leeward hoist. Um, have you got? Can you add anything on stopping getting roll chain? Um, well, I suppose I just add to what what you said there and. and I know it's probably going to be come up in the in the talk later in the week by by the crews, but there's there's elements the crews do most of it to ensure that the, the hoist is good. And that's you know if you're on starboard a way out from the windward mark, the, the good crews will start to hook the the guy on before they get to the windward mark. They leave the pole just sort of floating there. Um, so there's, a, there's a lot of prep work really. Um, yeah. That can be done before. And if, if if you're coming in on port, you know you're not going to have the chance. Then you're kind of aware that some of the other boats will, will be set up like that, so you might need to go. Uh, your angle out of the, the window mark might need to be a little bit tighter to make sure that no one's going to hoist and get straight over you because you're going to be that, that few seconds slower. But, um, okay. All right, so just moving on to another, one, another scenario then. So, again, you know, trying to rewind. So, here's another one I've, I've come up to the wooden mark. I mean, you know, this, this could be true in, in, in five boat fleet, it could be true in a, in a hundred boat fleet. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a few scenarios here, but it's an alarm. But so why? I mean, you know, the question is why? Why isn't this alarm bell? What's the scenario here that's going to end badly? Well, actually, it's because, I, first of all, I'm not winning. I'm not winning in this scenario. And I've got a chunk of the fleet, right, to the left of me, pushing out. We're all pushing out to one side, pushing out in this scenario to the right-hand side. So what's going to happen here? You know, if you, you rewind that in a couple of steps, well, actually... The, the green boat and the pink boat um, are just going to progress very near to the ley line. So unless I do something right now, 
I'm just going to be either tacked on by pink or green, or I'm going to be following in on a ley line, or I'm going to be over the windward mark ley line and have to sail an extra distance to get past the ley line. Because a lot of the guys that are just ahead of me um, are pushing out towards the ley line going the same direction as me. This is an alarm bell situation because I'm predicting that, that I'm going to be, to be honest, shafted on the, on the, on the ley line to the windward mark. So what I do in this scenario, well, actually, perhaps I do need to put a tack in now, perhaps. And there's quite a, some quite good rules that people do about thirds, right? If you're not in the front pack, right, if you're not in the front pack um, and you're trying to work out how to cleanly uh, get towards the windward mark, a really good um, good sort of rule of thumb, I think, is, is, is uh, I think there's one in um, Mark Russell's book that explains it quite well. It's about uh, rule of thirds. So if you... If you half, was it half distance? I'm trying to remember now. But anyway, so what it is, is, is tacking here before the windward mark ley line um, so that the guys in front are going to progress uh, towards the ley line, but I'm going to have a clear lane on, on starboard here and duck take some transoms or, or, or pass behind them and have a nice clean lane on starboard uh, before the windward mark ley line and then have to put one more hitch back out to the windward mark. Yeah, you're much more likely to have a, a, a cleaner lane uh, when you're in second row, uh, tacking, you know, taking that third from the woodward mark, um, taking your long tack uh, a, third, a third of the way up, for example. Does that make some sense? Perhaps, I don't know, Mike, have you got any sort of rules on, uh, on how to approach, you know, perhaps when you're not winning, I think this scenario is. Um, so... What, you, what you've got there pretty much describes how our first day at Mounts Bay happened. Mm -hmm. So, um, although we were, we had, we had okay starts, but what I generally find happens at the Wimmer Mark, particularly in a big fleet, is you end up getting this triangle of death at the Wimmer Mark. And if, if you're not in the first five or six boats, you end up getting caught. If you, uh, if you drew a line, the, the ley lines from, from that Wimmer Mark, and you're not in the first pack and you get caught in that triangle you just see that the entire fleet almost sail around you so the important bit about a big event is at some point you've got to hit that ley line mm -hmm. and ideally yes you can you need to come in on, on a clear lane but if for instance so our situation was that picture but then imagine about five or six boats in front of you towards the ley line the problem you've got if you tack on starboard there and go underneath them is that you've got an awful lot of dirty air from the boats that are already going around the windward mark. So, That's right. So it's a case of knowing how far away you are in the pack relative to the leaders, relative to the pack that you're you're dealing with. And perhaps it's almost a you know a lesser of two evils in some scenarios, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So it's it's tactics are. I've always thought tactics are mega easy if you've got fast boat speed and the best boat handling because you'll you'll be near the front anyway off the start um and it gives you choices if you don't quite get the first bit of the first beat right or the start then it also becomes a little bit more problematic but perhaps um, you know certainly certainly in the big champs perhaps sometimes you know the championships won or lost by your ability to recover yes definitely yeah yeah for sure and in that in that sort of scenario, when it's when it's going when it's going when it's going poorly, I know this isn't how how it's how it's um, how it's said in the textbooks and stuff. Sometimes just smashing that port ley line and hoping there's a gap sometimes works, um, yeah. and, and hoping you can get through. Um, you sometimes sometimes you have to roll that dice if it's going badly for you and you want to win. Because at the end of the day, if you want to win, you're not going to be counting something in the twentieths. So. You've got to. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. But it, again, it's about predicting scenarios. You know, it's about there are a lot of permutations. But actually, what do I think is about to happen in the next in the next twenty seconds? You know, can I? You know, am I happy with this as a risk? Perhaps there's no alternative. But actually, let's let's try and look ahead a little bit more. You know. So let's uh, progress on to another one. So, uh, I mean, it's fair. Let's have a with this. Say again. That's enough. Um, fairly self-explanatory this one I suspect but but again what this is doing is joining the dots together about decision making so you know it's not tactics isn't do I go left of the beat do I go right of the beat actually 
sometimes you know you have to uh, predict a long a long way in the future perhaps and that's not on the same leg you know where do i want to come out of this mark um where do i want to you know what what are my options as they as they unfold a decision you know halfway up the beat could even lead to you know potentially a, a a lack of options on a run, for example, which can in turn lead to a lack of options to, to select the right the right lured mark, or if there's a gate, for example. And that's something that I learned so much from from four seventy racing was that sometimes your tactic the fleet is so close together that that sometimes your tactics are drawn out uh, you know play out from a decision you made quite a long time ago, uh, and so you've got to be conscious of that fact. So what happens in this scenario? So we're above the lay line. Um, we've got the guy underneath us, uh, you know, there's a scenario here that does play out, of course, that means I, I'm going to end up low on the, uh, out of the mark. So uh, there, there was another, another picture, but you can, you can imagine the scenario here where we drive, we end up low, late outside the blue boat, we get rolled by one boat, we get rolled by the next boat, and the long drive on, on port towards the lured mark, which is offset, uh, we've lost our we've lost our option uh, and we're going to lose some places because of our decision making on the approach to the windward mark you know? that happens a lot more you know as you get back into the middle of the fleet back into the you know even outside the first five where, where it actually becomes tighter and much more difficult and uh, this is the sort of scenario that happens uh, perhaps a lot more so where do i do i tack underneath somebody on a little line do i do i go do i duck them and tack after them is a function of whether I think I need to early jive out of the mark. You know? Does that make sense? Yeah, and I suppose uh, flicking on to the next one here is is what is uh, the, the alternative here, I suppose, is that if I'm not locked above that, that, that blue guy, actually the area to attack this run is the early jive straight away. You know, yes, that revol re re revolves around a good heist, good boat handling, but actually, this is the area that I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to attack this perhaps with no jive because I know that it's long jive port uh, all the way down to the mark. It's going to give me much more options to uh, to capitalise on, on any other shifts or, or more pressure coming down on that right-hand side looking at wind. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, I'm just going to... Um, there's a strange picture coming up, but I haven't necessarily managed to uh, split these, these pictures up here. So another scenario that happens quite frequently is, is again, talking about window mark approaches, right? Um, so the scenario here, if I zoom in a little bit, uh, is we are, we're, well, we're in, we're in purple boat, say, um, and we've got a decision to make, uh, and it's, it often is a tack or duck, um, tack or duck scenario, right? Do we tack or do we duck, right? And and if we're if we're pink here, uh, what we want to know is, is is the other guy on the ley line. In this scenario, I've drawn a drawn a starboard around him, uh, perhaps because I was maybe thinking about team racing at the time. But in club racing, that happens a lot more, and it gives so much more power to the guy on the right hand side. Um, so, do I tack or do I duck? That's a that's a really good decision gate. You know, do I tack and lose someone or do I duck their transom? What's going to play out in the next sort of three or four moves here? Well, in this scenario. Actually, the green boat isn't on lay line. Uh, ducking him here uh, gives you a powerful position to hold him on starboard, uh, and then for you to go around the mark here. Yeah? Um, so, how do we combat that? So, so, so the alarm bells here is actually for the green boat. Yeah, it's probably for both, but it's actually for the green boat. So, I need to predict. Um, I'm not on the lay line, so I'm approaching uh, in one A here. I'm approaching. I'm not on the lay line for the mark. I've got a, got a purple boat that's coming in on port that might duck me and I'm, I'm going to be in a bit of trouble here. How do I prevent that happening? Well, actually, sometimes as right-of-way boat, you might take the opportunity to tack before he gets to you. Yeah? You're going to tack on the port. You're going to put a little hitch in, as shown in 1D. You're going to put a little hitch in up to that ley line uh, and protect your, your way that you want to go out on the mark. Yeah? Just because you're a right-of-way boat doesn't mean that you have to get to him. Put yourself in the better position uh, by thinking about it earlier, yeah? Not waiting for it to unfold like this. Does that make a bit of sense? Mike, do you get that? Does, that, yeah. does, does it make sense? Yeah. Quite a complex scenario perhaps, but, but it, again, it's about the decision making is tack or duck. 
But that doesn't have to be one boat's decision, the guy that's ducking. Actually, it's the other boat that can make that decision as well. Yeah? Predicting what's going to happen um, before it's going to happen. You know? and again, it comes to, down to experience, but let's at least be conscious in our minds about what's going to happen. Um, listen, I've, got, I've probably got a load more of these sort of scenarios, and you could go on all day about it, but let's, let, let's not uh, dwell too much. I, I'll have a look through my archive and see, see how many more I've got. Um, Does anyone want to fire out any any uh, random questions? Mm. Perhaps tactic related, but maybe not. I guess maybe Mike, I'll start at rolling just to uh, just to maybe kick it off. Maybe you want to tell us. Um, I think I said earlier we we don't change a rig much. We kind of one setting maybe break back one in windy weather. I remember talking to Sam, he kind of had a light, a medium and a heavy setting. What, what, what do you do or what's your sort of preference? Um, so yeah, so I'm similar. So yeah. I, I think Sam's probably got his light, medium, heavy setting from when, um, when they took that boom, when they got the boom, him and Andy Hunter got the boom boat off me. Um, so, and I had that because I, I had a light, medium and um, heavy setting because I was sailing a lot with Lizzie and we were light. So, so I needed a, so our windy setting you would never go on, I don't think. Um, your windy setting would have been uh, the medium setting that Lizzie and I had. So um, again, uh, with Chris, I, I've only ever used the windy setting uh, once or twice and regretted it when I did because I went too far but then when I've used it with Liz it, we've been dynamite with it so for, for, for to just so everyone knows what, what this light medium and heavy setting is so light setting is pretty much what the tuning guide says from from the 90s so 400 pounds rig tension 21 foot 10 rake um, a sensible sheeting angle on the jib and that's pretty much it um, and then the windy setting is basically the, the exact same thing, but with higher rig tension. So, um, and I achieve that by pulling the shrouds down by half a hole and pulling the rig tension to the same point. And that pretty much put about a hundred pounds on the rig tension and kept everything else very similar. Put a tiny bit of pre-bend in, but you're talking a few millimeters. And then the windy setting above that, which I only ever used a few times with Lizzie, was down another half hole on the shrouds. And then um, the same rig tension as the medium one. So that meant the, the luff wire was about an inch further up the mast where I pulled it on, I think. Um, so if, you, if, you, if you're weighing less than... 22 stone that would be a useful setting for you for when it's 20 knots plus um and that's about it really i mean that you know, i'll add a little well what i think um and, and the answer the answer to what i think is i've got no idea uh so, so it turns out that I, I don't i often find that i just don't have enough data to make these decisions because you know the, one of the problems are you know I, I don't do enough racing against the likes of shane likes of uh, likes of mike you know, actually, quite frequently, we only turn up and race against each other, you know, at the World Championships. And, it, and it, it's scary sometimes because often I, find, I feel that I don't know how quick we are, um, uh, you know, against the key players that I want to be fast against until I come off the start line of the first race. I come off the start line of the first race and then suddenly I know the answer, or at least I know the answer for, for that particular scenario, you know. Uh, and I really struggle with that. And, and maybe the answer is, you know, go sailing more uh, you know, against these guys. Yeah, pros and cons, isn't it? Um, so I don't feel like I, I, I've never had enough data. That's not because I, I doubt, you know, oh, that you know, having windy settings or light settings will be quicker. I mean, it might be. Sometimes I struggle to, uh, you know, to, to get enough time in the water racing at all these championships uh, to really, you know, know the answer. Um, but it's okay. I've, that's not to say that I haven't uh, delved down some data. Um, uh, you know, I I never really went for many settings. I think having one setting across the range is probably okay. Um, we did uh, go to. I have uh, uh, 
frequently gone to what the other guys say, which was down half a hole, pulling on to the, the same mark, which effectively gives you virtually the same mass rake, but with more tension on. Yeah. And uh, one of the benefits of that, and the main benefit as far as I really think, is uh, trying to reduce luff sag on the, on the Genoa. You've got a massive Genoa, uh, and actually having too much luff sag um, uh, is, is probably a bad thing. I think, and I actually do think it is more important in the plastic boats because, uh, you know, I, I think that whether it's true or not, uh, whether I have enough data to back it up, I'm not sure, but I think that the, there is more stiffness in, in some of the wooden boats um, because there's a lot more mass uh, spaced out a little bit further. And I, for example, can't get my lured shroud to flap in, in a duffin, but I could do it in a, in a, in a window, for example. So to counter that, you'd perhaps go more likely to go for more tension uh, in the wind just stuff in a duffin to try and reduce luff in, in a window, sorry, in a plastic boat to try and reduce luff side. Um, but again, that's just my 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 opinion. Does that answer your question, Shane? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I was just interested more to be honest. What what other people you get asked a lot, people ask me a lot what what rig settings I use and. Um, I always feel I'm disappointing them if I tell them I, I tend to use one set in really across the across the range. But um, just that's, that's what it is, with the exception of if it's really really heavy. Um, I don't know. Has anyone any other specific questions or any information they want? I guess it's a, it's a good time to ask on 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 anything really, not necessarily tactics. Yeah. I, I, well, please do, do do interrupt me while you do ask. But what I might, I be what I think would be quite interesting. And we talked about a little bit about uh, campaigning uh, and how we prepare year out to to our campaigns. Now, of course, uh, you know what the hell is going to happen next year? Okay, it's not this year now. How is the campaign going to fold out? You know, or, or unfold for for next year for the for the twenty for the quarter twenty twenty world or the twenty 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 one world championships. You know, we're a year out. Actually, none of us have done any sailing. We're unlikely to get any competitive racing against each other. Uh, we don't know if, you know, whatever kit we're, we're using, and maybe we've got different kit. Um, we're not going to have a lot of data against each other. Um, shit, what the hell's going to happen for next year? How do we, how do we sort of, how do we, I don't know, what do we do about that? I am not. can't say I've thought about it yet, but I'm thinking about it now. How do I put yeah. that thing together for, uh, for next year, you know, with, with potentially limited time on the water? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, and the first thing you got to do, I suppose, is is you do know the venue. You know, you know where it's going to be. You know, it's 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 scary. Um, it's on the sea. It's tidal. So there's a couple of a uh, couple of things straight away. Um, if it was this week, it's sunny and very windy. So that could lead to big waves. But on other on other on other weeks, it can be uh, can be very calm and, and shifty there as well. So, so, so again, it's, it's a bit like, a bit like talking about going to prepare for cross the range. You, you would want to be, I don't think you'd want to prepare for this one to, uh, to put a bank on. It's going to be light or it's going to be heavy. Okay, it could, could be either. So, um, so but, and, and, but I think, uh, you know, I think the reality is that, you know, we're all going to be rusty, you know, for the foreseeable. We're not actually, there's a great opportunity, I think, for, uh, should we say some young guns, uh, you know, and, and maybe, um, or maybe not so young, that, that you know, have been knocking on the door for a long time to, um, to probably mix it up a little bit because, as I say, you know, everyone's in different scenarios right now, you know, doing strange things. Um, maybe there is an opportunity for someone to, you know, to put some time in, find a way of putting some time in, sort their, their situation out, hit a hard winter, and, and come out sh uh, fighting next year, maybe. What do you think, Mike? What are you doing? What's your plan? Um, Jump. <laughs> well, I, I, well, I actually pulled my entry from Scaries <laughs> before uh, before COVID hit. Um, not, be I really wanted to do it, but may I just couldn't make it work with the family because the age ages the kids are at, um, and I didn't think it was fair that I um, I sailed and Lizzie didn't. To be honest with you, so um, yeah, so we're we're we're, we're most likely gonna give it a miss although i don't know i might try and uh, no one tell lizzie this i might try and sneak it in there somehow <laughs> i don't know 
Um, so, I don't know. I, if my advice would be um, is you will um, never ever get a better opportunity to sort out the long-term bits that will make you faster, which is, which is fitness and crew weight than what we have at the moment. So, um, the, um, so if you have a, um, it's the biggest thing that will make it, that's made me go faster over the last few years is, is getting fitter. And so I would use the time to maybe take up another sport where you can apply some of the principles, you know, in, in sailing and, and just occupy the time that way. Um, and then when, when, um, when, when we can all go racing again, then just then hit it hard then, I think, and get a plan together. Don't do too much. Try and do, try and just sim similar to what I said before. So try and do some practice at, the, at a similar sort of venue to what Scaries is like. So go somewhere tidal, um, some, something along those lines. But uh, if it was me, I'd be focusing on fitness and and crew weight, making sure you get yourself in that magic number of whatever it is for your boat to, to get yourself as, as fast as possible. Does that make Can sense? I, yeah. Could I just ask a question actually, please? Yeah. Um, yeah, so about the getting fit and taking up another sport, mm. what other sport, is there another sport you could recommend that would be a good preparation for sort of um, getting fit for sailing for the right sort of muscle groups? Cycling. Cycling is probably the easiest one at the moment. And then do something with your arms. Um, yeah. Cycling, you'll be exercising the quads and everything. Um, so, and cycling so accessible. So and you can do it, do it everywhere. So cycling and swimming probably is probably the best thing for, I would say, sailing. Um, I, should give, I, should, uh, I should give a plug for my wife who does, uh, who does fit, uh, sailing specific fitness classes incidentally, but. Yeah, I'm doing those. Yeah, you are, yeah, I do, I think that you are, you are. Well, there you go, well, you can recommend them, can't you? Yeah, they're very good. Okay. I've just got to, yeah, no, they are very good. I, I've got a question, guys. Um, oh. You hear me okay? Yeah, it's yeah. Hilarious, Ross. I'm having some uh, IT issues, two seconds. Um, yeah, I think we're very fortunate to have, um, obviously, three, three world champions on the call. I think, you know, probably be good to ask, a question around how you manage that um, that pressure and the tactics of a of a week, which we all know, and I've been on the wrong end of it, um, where it hasn't gone uh, a particular way. But I think it's quite a complex mindset to have throughout that week. Do you guys can you share any 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 sort of um, thoughts around how you deal with that and and how that's paid off for you, and maybe how it hasn't paid off for you potentially in the past as well. I could start with that because I've had uh, I've had plenty of bad weeks. You know, you're probably the, the, a bad person to answer this. Um, so usually, usually, uh, and this is just this is just totally it will be different for everybody, I think. But um, usually, if there's any pressure or you're leading and, or halfway through or whatever, um, it, it's more I find if if you're really enjoying it, you just focus on the why you're there. You just love the week. You enjoy the week. Um, that's really it, it, that doesn't really affect them. But it's when you think if you think about it too much or you're too focused on the results and you kind of lose sight of why you're doing it, that's when I tend to go badly. Um, usually, find I'm, I'm doing well when I'm enjoying it, and it's it's that way. It's taken me a while to figure out rather than the other way around. It's not I enjoy it because I do well. It's 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 more I tend to do well when, when I'm actually like and say that most of all and. Pressure hasn't really affected them so much. So, I think. What about maybe tactic size, though, Shane? In terms of a tactics conversation, you know, quite often you, if you are in that championship leading position, or even in the top three or five, or whatever it might be, or it could be top three or five of the silver fleet or the bronze fleet. And um, how do your tactics potentially vary throughout the week based on the situation you're in overall in the championship? Do you think about that much? I'm sure you do, but can you talk about it? <laughs> no, not, not so much. Not until uh, very late. Try and keep us keep, keep the same approach. And I know some people you can get caught up too much with one or two rivals, and um, I think the, the more you try, and uh, particularly 
World Championships are, are they're different, aren't they? Because it's the first time that it's usually, the, the, well, the British Nationals is often a smallish fleet. The World Championships tends to be over 100 boats. It's back to big fleet sailing. It's a bit more like the sort of old-fashioned championships where it's more about uh, treating the fleet as a whole and a bit more conservative. Um, whereas in a smaller event, you might be thinking about a particular rival or one or two other sailors. So um, for, for the Worlds, try to tend just to, until the very end, you try and um, regard the fleet as a whole. But um, yeah, sure. I guess... The smaller fleets and other ones, you have to. I guess things start to emerge as the week goes on. Every week's different. To be sometimes one or two people come out that can. You have to keep an eye on. I guess. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, add, I'll add a add a couple of points to that because I've uh, got it spectacularly wrong and um, got it right on a couple of occasions as well. And um, and, you, and you learn. I think you have to. I think you have to get it wrong. You have to. I think you have to earn your stripes. I think unless you're Ben Ainsley or something, something like that, then um, you've got to earn your stripes at uh, at, uh, at winning events. I think, and um, I think one of the biggest problems when you come to the pointy end of a championship and you're in the and you've got the, the potential to win it is the thing that you find most difficult is you've got too much time to think. That's the problem, and you end up and you end up overthinking a really quite simple issue. And a really quite simple issue is just what can you control? And it's effectively, is it, do you, do you need to just go out and win this race or do you need to do some other match racing to give you the best possible chance of, of success based on who the competition is? And, um, and that's basically it. And the problem is because we are a sport that has a championship over a week is that you have the previous night and the next morning to think about all the permutations that are going to happen. So you end up getting to the start line really like um, quite um, not relaxed. You're not smooth. Um, and there's so many cliches you could say here, but you'd be like, you'd be like, you'd be like watching me swim versus an Olympic swimmer. <laughs> like someone who's like trying to thrash the water and then someone who's gracefully going through it. Um, so it's that's the difficulty and it, it just focuses on stuff like what shane said and making sure you enjoy the reason there i mean i'll be honest with you i struggled a little bit after the worlds for um for um motivation for sailing and stuff like that because it took me a while to figure out actually it's the pro it's actually the process it is a cliche but it's the process of actually trying to win the thing that's enjoyable but yes you have the elation of you've just won the thing but actually the the whole process of the the years up to it is the most enjoyable bit. The bit after it is a bit. Uh, it's, it's a bit I suppose I'll, I'll I'll add a little bit there is that um, and it probably takes on to your your point, Ross. Uh, you know when there's pressure, and actually I, I do believe that uh, defending you know defending a, a title is is one of the hardest things you can do, and also one of the most important, Mike. Actually, um, <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, that, I mean, yeah. That, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, I'll give you Lizzie's number, so uh, I have to fight that battle first. <laughs> but uh, but it is hard, and because you know you've got various pressures and whatnot, and, and maybe it's because you're winning, uh, maybe it's because you're expected to win. Uh, but but the, that comes actually if you basically the pressure um, comes from it, it preys on on the lack of preparation. So if you've not done enough work, if you've not put the time in, and not done the work on whatever aspect it is, the pressure will sort of prey on that, and that will that will be your downfall you know and you might get lucky and you might it might not happen but actually it will yeah if, if there's something there's something where you'll crack is because you haven't done enough, enough time in there and you'll know that before it happens actually um and that, that, that's what happens so but in terms of how you then actually go about go about it in terms of managing decisions yeah i've, I've made the mistake of sort of engaging at all times and, and and trying to take on too much rather than you know letting it play out a little bit um because actually sailing is a it's quite a negative sport and that it, it's a it's a sport of uh, making mistakes you know everyone is a conveyor belt of, of making mistakes and less mistakes wins right um and so you can you, you can and, and you can just wait for other people to make mistakes quite frequently because it won't happen you just need to be in a position to capitalize on that so perhaps that's you know not um 
you know, not trying to force a situation. Um, uh, you know, not to, but it, perhaps it links a little bit to to the some of the um, some of the decision making points I was making earlier on, on, on recognizing situations is that you, you've got to rely on your experience and your good judgment rather than trying to force a situation to happen. You know, when, if you use the word hope, if you never think, oh, I hope this happens, you're you're in trouble there. You know, as soon as you start hoping for things to happen, uh, you're on the back foot. Um, you've got to rely on your experience and your good judgment, um, and that does come from a long, long time. But importantly, try not to do things differently. You know, stick to what you know, um, and and um, enjoy it. Like Shane says, at the end of the day, uh, it's only a sport. Doesn't matter. Enjoy it. I've got I've got a story for Mike, just to reassure him that even Ben is mortal. I, I once uh, had Roddy and. Uh, Ainsley say, you're the Irish coach, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, I've got a boat. Uh, Ben's in the Silver Fleet in this World Championship, mm -hmm. and you're coaching the Irish Fleet, most of whom are also in the Silver Fleet. Let's get in and coach our rest of people. So Ben was at the back end of a very light weather championship. Ben has served his time at the back as well as the front. Be reassured about that. <laughs> uh, it's useful to know. Yeah, yes. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure, Ian, are we getting to a winding up point? I think we are. I mean, I, I don't know what our time clock was, but, um, you know. You've done, you've done pretty well. You've done an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, congratulations. Uh, well, I mean, I'm happy to take one more question if there happens to be a burning one out there. Otherwise, I'll let uh, sure. me wrap it up. I've got one, guys. Um, Ian, I think you mentioned, I think it was left side. Sorry, it's, it's the, the side, us South Africans get a little... Um, we, 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 we lose the accent and you'll lose my accent. Um, and it sounded like you were, you were mentioning that the leeward shroud or the leeward stay was too slack when probably going upwind. And I know my other boat that I race is a 505. So I tend to watch the leeward shroud when I've got the, the crew on the trapeze and just keeping it tight. So are you watching the leeward shroud in a similar way on the GP to maintain upward speed and, and, and adjusting your rig trenches? Oh. I think it's, uh, I think you make a really valid point. Uh, okay, and trapezes uh, tend to also do funny things to rigs, but, um, <laughs> but actually it's a really visible, war uh, I say warning sign, it's a really visible um, thing that you can, you can notice. Um, and it's just, uh, I say a barometer. Um, you know, you, you, if you can see that, I can't see how much tension is on it, but I can tell when there's no tension on it. So, so I think it's a warning sign of of jib of sag, uh, in my opinion, uh, in a in a GP because a GP of course has a massive jib, um, uh, and then there's a, there's a significant worry that the rig's falling off the lured uh, and being pushed over with a lot of luff sag on the jib. So, and it's a it's a common rule that you'll hear from a lot of classes actually is that you know just tight on the on the lured shroud uh, is a is a reasonable thing. Um, but it is something I've noticed more on, on the, on the window, uh, if I'm completely honest. So yes, I would, I would suggest, uh, thinking about, um, using more attention in those scenarios. So definitely tighter is better than, than, than loose. You, you don't want to see it. You, you're not watching to see if there's any slight tension or managing it. You're rather just err on the side of tight. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm conscious to, you know, say too much because of course I don't know how much would be on it if you just pulled it on. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I I would certainly err against if it looks visibly slack. I would be thinking about trying the setting with more tension on it. Thanks. I think uh, I think with, with with rig tension in particular on the on the water, it's it's uh, it's a bit like everything you're saying. It's a bit of an art <laughs> rather than a science. So. Um, I, I just go, yeah, I just go, out, yeah. yeah, I just, I just go by the rule. If the boat feels like it's dancing, it's ready to go. That's pace. And, and it's really difficult to put that into numbers and what it feels like. But if something doesn't look right, it probably isn't the best way to think of it. Sorry to be very simplistic about it, but <laughs> it's, um, it's the same when it's light. I release, I release rig tension progressively, the lighter it gets because if you try sailing a boat with 400 pounds of rig tension when there's five knots or less of wind, it just feels horrendous. I can't tell you the reason why or whatever, it just does. 
So. I mean, a lot of the, some of the reason for that is because, um, you know, some of the reason that certainly yacht sailors are really into that. And a lot of it is because, uh, you know, Genoa's are designed against a certain amount of luff sag, right? So if you, you know, they need a certain deflection on the, on the, on the, um, on the, on the fourth day to allow the Genoa to be uh, the right shape, should we say. Uh, and if you if you don't achieve that through light winds, um, then progressively light, making it lighter, allowing that tiny bit of luff sight uh, helps achieve the sort of design shape of the Genoa. That's one reason anyway, but there's probably a few more. Right. Um, thank you, Charlie. I could just thank uh, some wonderful insights there. Very useful, both in terms of speed and in tactics. Can I thank the night's three speakers. Uh, it's done a great job. Uh, you've really set the standard for the other two nights. I'm going to thank Anne for setting all of this up. Great job, Anne. Uh, well done. Uh, I see our audience is really quite international, which is wonderful. And I hope that the recording of this uh, has come off. And if it has, then it, we will be making it available at some stage in the future. I also point out that you've almost doubled the uh, audience we had for last night's AGM. So well done, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>